Okay, everyone. So uh, I just want to look at the calendar together and make sure everybody's on the same page here. So here we are. Uh, and this week, you have homework due tomorrow and Friday. That's unusual. Usually it's Monday and Wednesday, but I pushed it back a day, as I told you in the, uh, I sent you out an email because uh, our lecture last time did not record. And so uh, we got a little behind and people, so here's the lecture from spring and, but you guys are fine, the people who are in class. This was just the online people have to watch these. All right, hopefully it will record this time. So um, look at this, we've got the bonus survey to do. Um, and this is, these surveys are really fun, so let's look at our results from bonus survey one, and we can do some eye clicker questions to make sure uh, everybody's eye clicker is working. So let's just look at our data program here. And for those of you who didn't take the survey, um, this is what we're doing is really fun. We're analyzing our own data. I mean, stats can be about anything, so might as well be about us, right? So we can uh, learn through narcissism or whatever you want to call it, but at least it'll be fun. And it can interest you all in yourselves, right? Okay, so these are the questions that we've asked. And let's just look at some of the results here. And some of my favorite ones are down here. I love this one. Okay, so we're going to look at this one. Do you believe there's only one person in the world who is your true love? Or do you think there are many who could be? How many people in the world do you think you could truly love? So here's the answer, zero is none, and it goes all the way up to six, which is millions. I just put them in these categories so we could do a nice little histogram. All right, so it's none, zero, a few, dozens. All right, so it will be interesting to see what you guys chose. So you can look at this yourself, and we're just going to go to histograms, and we can choose that variable, which is love. So let's see what you answered, and the way it's set up now, Let's adjust the intervals so that we can actually read the percents here. As you know, these, this is a histogram, so we're going to make each one, okay, there's six categories, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so you can see about 50% of you chose two, which was what? This is none, one, a few. So about 50% of you think there's a few people. Well, I hope you find those few people. I mean, think about how many people, what if they're like in some tiny little village in Africa or something. I mean, you're in trouble. I mean, there's only a couple of them, right? Think about your odds. You better be, okay? <laughs> now, um, some of you are just already cynical, right? And then some of you are way up here. Millions, okay. So I'm gonna ask you an eye clicker question just to anticipate. Um, let's split on the data and see, do you think there's a difference? Let's pull up my first eye clicker question here. And let us see, let's see, where did I put this? Let's see if it's in here. Yeah, this is it, okay. So let's just do this, and here we go. Okay, so let's start this. It's just a multi, okay, so frequency code is double A. You got that? Closing this, all right. So let's just start it. So who, will believe that there are more people they can truly love. Do you think it's going to be evenly divided? Do you think males are going to be, or females are going to say there's more people they could love, or do you think it's about the same? It's just anticipating, just getting a, it's like betting on the answer. No right or wrong. I mean, it's just having you, I love looking at data, and I just want to get you to love looking at data. That's all. So, just choose anything and vote. And then we'll just see. Okay, we'll do it with a few of our questions and we're going to do this throughout the semester. And even better, we are going to analyze our own data and have it, you know, be fun. Okay, so everybody's, let's stop it at uh, 50 seconds here. Okay, and let's see what you guys said. So, you think what? This is males, females, the same. Okay, so people think, if anything, it's males, nobody, I mean, yeah, most people think it's the same. All right, 
let's see what the let's see what uh, the results are. So we'll get out of here and go to here. Okay, so what do we want to do here? We want to split. So you can do this at home, and you're going to, you know, I hope you do. We're going to choose a split on gender, okay? And then we're going to split the data right here, okay? And let's look at it. Those histograms look different. Let's look at the statistics here. What's the difference you see? Look up here at the high end. These are females and these are males. And here's the statistics. The average is higher for males, okay? Do you see how it looks? Do you see how males are more likely to choose the million, the hundreds, thousands, and millions? They might have a different definition of true love, too. That could be it. But let's look at the, there's another thing we should look at, and that could be, instead of the histograms, maybe the box plots. Let's try that. Whoa, I didn't look at these box. What does that even mean on the box plot? Whoa, look at that. So this is really strikingly different. 50, what is this? Do you know what these box, this means that 50% of the people are within these limits here. Let's look at the stats and you'll see what I mean. Look at this. For females, the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile is the same. So they chose... Okay, and so for males, it's not. They had, a wide, they had a wider range. They had a bigger standard deviation. That's what's showing up here. Wow, that's very interesting. And if we go back to the, um, to the histograms, you'll see the same thing. Sorry, I'm not, don't let me get carried away with data. I'm just, you know, it's just when I see something new, I get very interested. So uh, if you look at the statistics here, you see that. The males have a bigger standard deviation. The reason there's just that little sliver is because there's only six choices you could do. One, two, three, four, five, six. So 50% of the females chose, the middle 50% chose two, which was what? Zero was none, one was uh, one, so it's a few. Okay? Well, you guys who choose millions, you're, uh, you're in good shape. You're bound to, you'll find someone. <laughs> When you get older, you'll probably think millions, you know, anybody, really. Okay, <laughs> at this point, you know. Okay, so that's, that's what's going, that's fun. Let's look at our next one, and um, we can look at another question here. Um, let's see what else we have here. How about, oh, here's a good one. I asked everybody, um, suppose you want a million dollars, and we're given the chance to either spend it on yourself or give it away to save the lives of children who would otherwise die of starvation. The more money you gave, the more children would be saved. Let's say each dollar saved a child's life. What percent of the money would you give away? All right, so let's ask the eye clicker. First, let's just look at the data here while we're here. So we're going to go to histograms, and let's look at, we're going to get rid of the split, and let's look at charity and see what happens. And Let's see, how many intervals do we want to, people could answer anything, I guess, so let's just, you see these spikes? They like to answer round numbers. So this is 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, and 100. Whoa, some of you are very generous. You'd give away 100? That's, that's phenomenal. I guess, you know, if the children were right in front of you, it would be hard to say, oh, well, you're going to die. But, um... Some of the people are saying, zero? Zero? Are you serious? Okay. So, here's our data. Here's our stats. And let's just do the same thing again. The median's 50. Average is 40. Okay. 289 of you. This is your data. Answered this question. All right. So, let's pull up our iClicker question. And let's go for this one. And that is um, charity. So men are more, have more in, what, is, what do you want to say, more generous in love? Who's more generous with their pocket, with their money? Let's find out. <laughs> so vote. Oh, sorry, guys. I got to start it. Okay, there's about 90 of you. I'll wait till you get up to around 90. I think there's like 97 or something. Keep going. All right. You got it? We don't have to wait. I think that was all of you. Okay, 99. Anybody else? Even 100? Going for it? 
I guess this is it. 99 people in here. Oh, 100! Yes! We got it. Okay. So, now let's stop. Uh, we stop. And let's see. Who, what you thought? Okay, so here you're pretty sure the females may be about the same, but a lot of people think females are more generous. Interesting. All right, let's see what, what really is the story here. Whoops, all right. Okay, let's get rid of this. And what we want to do right now is just split again. So let's split and see what happens. Okay, at first glance, what do you see? There's still a big, they're not wildly different until you look at the tails. Look at the zero. <laughs> look at that zero. Oh my goodness, that's phenomenal. That's really different. But I think the, the ends are different. I think the hundreds more too. So let's check, let's look at the stats. And the average is higher for men. I mean, for females, you were right. The average is the standard deviation is higher for males. Males are just, have a bigger standard deviation on everything. They're more likely to be really high and low on almost every physical trait and also on every opinion for some reason. It just seems like it's that way. All right, so let's look at the box. I think you're right. If any, well, yeah, judging by the average, let's look at the box plots and see what that looks like. And yeah. Can you see, again, see that bigger 50%? Let's look at our stats here. Okay, so 50% of the men are between 10, 10%. The middle 50% is between the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile, between 10. Whereas with women, it's 28.5. It's much higher up here. Okay? Interesting. Hey, there's a lot more men in our class this time. This is a switch from stat 100. Okay. See, the interquartile range, the middle 50% is 70% 70 here, and it's 51 point. Very, men are more spread out in a lot of things. Very interesting. Okay, so now let's see what we're going to do. Now let's just go back to the document camera. Let's, um, and we'll look, we're going to look more at this data program. And always check the calendar. Okay, the whole course is at a glance. Those of you who are just joining, this is where you need to be. And this is where all the lectures are if you want to see something. Again, we're going to post this lecture right after class. So let's go to the notebook and we still, we say here I'm supposed to be on simple regression. We're going to get to it, but we have not finished part two on correlation, causation, and no, part two on observational studies and confounders, confounders. Okay. So that's where we have to finish today, and then we're going to start um, part three on simple regression. Okay, document camera. And if you haven't bought this notebook yet, please do. I, people have told me it's out of the stores, and if that's true, is any, raise your hand if you've had trouble buying it. Okay, see me after class. I have some I can sell it to you. All right. So this is where we left off. We were looking at this example of confounding. Remember what a confounder is. A confounder happens because there's an imbalance between people who are in the treatment and the control group. And it's not only a difference between the treatment and control group because they selected themselves. They don't, remember, we're talking about non-randomized experiments. When people divide themselves up and their system, either the researcher divides them up non-randomly or they choose themselves or fate or whatever. But anyway, there's a systematic differences, okay? A confounder is a difference between the treatment group and the control. In this case, we saw in observational data that lighters, people who carry lighters get more lung cancer. So if we didn't know better, we'd think, do lighters cause lung cancer, right? And if so, how? We said, well, maybe, maybe if lighters cause lung cancer, and we looked through all these, we said, oh, Perhaps it's the lighter fluid doing it. Perhaps it's fumes, carcinogenic fumes, that when they flick that lighter or flick their BIC, do they even still have those BICs? That was my day. Anyway, when they do that, the fumes are released, and that's, they breathe that in, and that could be a causal link. Think not casual. Some people say casual. Don't think that. I mean, you just read it that way wrong. 
Causal is important to say because it's a causation link. It will help you remember what it is, a causation link. It's if lighters really did it, this would be how. And that's what we said was the causal link, perhaps inhaling, okay? But what if this, what if it's something else? That lighters is really just a marker for some other thing that's really leading to both the lung cancer and the lighters, okay? And we thought cigarettes, right? Cigarettes is pretty the obvious one. Smoke, people who smoke cigarettes have a higher rate of lung cancer, right? Cigarettes cause lung cancer. And they're also, people who smoke cigarettes are more likely, it's going to lead them to buy lighters. So why is this important? It's really important because when you see the data, you're going to see this correlation. You're not going to be able to tell which situation this is. You'll see a correlation, and we have to figure out what, it's important because do you want to tell people to quit, if it's, we're in this situation, we tell them, hey, stop carrying your lighters, switch to matches, do something, it'll help you, and you'll lower your lung cancer. Whereas if in, you're in this situation, you tell them to quit carrying the lighters, it makes no difference. Their lung cancer rate won't go down. So it's very important to get a causation if you care about affecting change. If you just care about making a prediction to see, oh, somebody with a lighter, they're likely to get lung cancer. But if you want to know what's causing what, you, this is a very important. All right, and then people say there's a lot of, this is the most common trap everybody falls into when thinking about um, observational data. They think there's many, many, many causes of the response. In this case, the response is lung cancer, right? This is the response. There's many, many causes, many, many causes. And they think confounders are just another cause. Like some people, like genetics, for example. People will say, well, there's lots of causes of lung cancer, it's not necessarily cigarettes or anything. Genetics, that's true. There are lots of causes of lung cancer. But remember what we're trying to do here. We are trying to figure out if there's any connection between lighters and lung cancer, between the treatment, the treatment, and the response, right? So a confounder is a difference between those who carry lighters and those who don't, a systematic difference, besides the fact they carry lighters, right? that could be causing the response. So it has to be connected to both of them. You have to be able to draw an arrow from the confounder to both of them. And genetics is not one because it has nothing to do with lighters. People, yes. What does it have to do with lighters? Is it the same gene that causes people to get lung cancer, going to cause them to carry lighters? It's ludicrous. So it doesn't explain why we see that connection. And same with uh, radon. Radon does raise one's exposure, raise exposure to radon, ex raises one's risk for lung cancer. But it's not either confounder or ca causal link because it's not linked, because it's not connected to the, lung to the uh, lighters. Does that make sense to everyone? All right, so I'm going to just ask you an eye cl clicker and what we just talked about. And I, uh, the last thing I want you to do is get worried about, oh, do I get it right or wrong? Because that will just destroy your, um, you're, you're fun and you're thinking about this. You're just getting participation grades, but it will help you. You'll see the same questions on the exams. It will really help you if you think about it. So let's just quickly go to the, um, to the, I, to the PC here, and let's just pull up the eye clickers again. And OK, questions. And I think these were back here. We did some of these. Um, Let's just do this. This is what we did last time. Let's see what else we have here. We did this, we did this, we did this, we did this. OK, let's try this one. I'll start it. Which of the following are possible confounders? This could be a good question for an exam, something like this. OK? And just, you know, I just want you to think about it some, but don't get nervous at all. Because I'm not marking these right or wrong. You're just, it's just participation. OK, come on, 100 people. Oh, good, we got it. OK, we'll stop it here. 
Let's see what you said. Um, the right answer is smoking cigars. Let's see if you got that. Okay, so let's just see. So some of you said all of the above. Let's look at this. Let's think about it. Um, all right. So smoking cigars is right. Why would you say all? Okay, now smoking marijuana, I told you this doesn't, this is, it ha remember, it has to be connected to both the treatment and the response. The treatment in this case was uh, the lighters. We're doing the same problem. So it's more like, and the response was the lung cancer. So it's a, this one isn't because it's a difference between, yeah, you're more likely to carry a lighter, but it's not a cause of lung cancer. I said that. Asbestos. This is a cause of lung cancer, but not a difference between lighter. It has to be both. Do you understand? Okay. Let's try the next one. What's the next one? Um, which of the following can, okay, let's start it so you can read it. Which of the following conditions have to be satisfied to be a confounder? All right. A systematic difference between the treatment and control groups other than the treatment. That's only A. A cause of the response other than the treatment. Only B. Both A and B. Neither A and B. Either A or B. I'm going to wait for your 100, so don't hold the class up. <laughs> I know this is kind of a hard one to these both, but it helps you to think this way now, and then when you see stuff like this on the exam, it will be better. So don't get nervous. Just answer. Come on, all 100. You got it. Okay, stop. All right, so. It's going to be what? It's going to be both, remember? That's what we talked about, C. Both, it has to be both linked. Think of a link. It has to be linked to both of those, because that's what we're seeing. So your confounder, you're seeing this treatment and response, the lighters and the lung cancer. Think of it as a treatment, lighters. Does lighters cause lung cancer? And you're looking for something that's linked to both, but is not a causal link. It's like a mixed up link, right? It has to be connected to both. That's making, it's a difference between them because they chose themselves that's mixing up their result. It's like making it look like there's a relationship when there's not. Great. You guys are doing really good. And I think that is the end of the, the questions here. So let's go back to the, um, let's go. Okay, so m must be both to explain why the treatment appears to cause the response when it doesn't. That's the idea. Okay. Oh, here's another one. We might as well do one more. This is a good one. Okay, one more and then we'll be done with this part. Which of the following studies don't have confounders? They don't have a systematic difference between treatments and control. Remember, if you don't, they're balanced to begin with, so they can't have confounders. Which one's going to be balanced to begin with? Hint, hint, hint. Oh, 102. Did two people just come from, whoa, they're coming out of the woodwork. All right, let's stop this. Let's see. Did you guys vote? Yeah. Okay, yeah, randomized double blind. Yep, most of you got it. So why? Let's get rid of this. Why? Because they eliminate systematic differences. That's why. As long as it's big enough. You know, you could have accidental differences that can mess things up. So we could uh, block ahead of time. But um, that would help. But there's, no, there's not systematic differences. It's not going to go in the same direction each time. OK? All right. Let's go back to the notebook and get going then. 
And so I think you understand this page now. I hope you do. So now what do we do? What do we do? And a big part of this course is going to be trying to figure out what you do to get rid of these confounders in observational studies. So how can we determine whether it's the lighters um, or the confounders, or maybe some combination of both that's actually causing the lung cancer? How do you know? How do you figure this out? Stratification. We want to compare apples to apples. These two groups are really unlike each other, right? So you break the population into subgroups where the confounding factor is the same, right? So if we think it's cigarettes, we look at, see, they're unbalanced to begin with, right? So these, you have people who, this is the treatment group, and this is the control. And because they weren't randomly assigned, you get this imbalance here when we're looking at the data. They both. These people are carrying lighters. Also, they have, they're more likely to carry lighters. And if you look at their, pretend we're on a scale of lung cancer rates, they're getting higher rates of lung cancer. This is, OK? So this is the response, and this is the treatment. No lighters are here, right? And it's imbalanced. So is it the lighters? Or is it something else they're doing like smoking cigarettes, right? Because they're also smoking cigarettes. So what do we do? We stratify and say, OK, let's eliminate that confounder and by comparing lung cancer rates of those who carry lighters to those who don't, none of whom smoke. If nobody's smoking, we're getting those cigarettes out of the picture. So here is no smokers. And we'll say, OK, we're still comparing the treatment to the control the lighters to the no lighters, and people who don't smoke, non-smokers, some of them might carry lighters for other reasons. Maybe, like we said, maybe uh, they're smoking marijuana, maybe they're doing campfires, I'm not sure what. But you, there might not be no lighters. There might, they might still be carrying lighters, but we're comparing the percents here. And it disappears. And then we'll look at moderate smokers. And again, the treatment and the control, the lighters and the no lighters. And we'll do a heavy smokers. We can do it at every level. This would be the lighters, and this is the no lighters. Why did I make it look like this, going up like this? Because I want to show that, yes, um, the more you smoke, the more you get lung cancer. So yes, there's heavy smokers are going to get a higher rate of lung cancer. But the difference between whether they carry lighters or matches makes no difference. right? And if you see something like this, in this case, there's no difference in cancer rates between those who carry lighters and those who don't within each level. Within each level. That doesn't always happen to be. But in this case, this is really what would happen. And of course, the heavy smokers have the highest cancer rate. But there's no difference. So it's not lighters that are doing it, right? This is a very clear case where the lighters are just markers for people who smoke. Does this make sense? Now, what would happen if we tried something else, let's say, or let's, and let's say it still stayed like this, like that, the same way? That would mean that wasn't a confounder. We have to look for other confounders. And we're going to see this in the experiment that we're doing right now that's going on between the online people and the in-class people all throughout the semesters. We're going to start, we're going to look at our own data or look at past data, because we did this last year in STAT 100, and start thinking what we could think, what do we think could be confounders? And we'll look at differences. We'll see in our data, are there differences between the, in, in, in um, males versus females? That could be a confounder. And they choose to take one course or the other, and then we'll see if there's a difference in their overall scores at the end. You know, when we break it, when we just look among girls, for example, who choose online versus uh, in person. And we'll see if it looks like this, or if it looks, if it's not a confounder. And this is a really important process of uh, figuring out what's going on. And then we're also, uh, preview, we're also going to be building regression models. So another way to do this stratification is by including whichever you think is a confounder, like let's say you thought gender was a confounder, as an independent variable 
along with uh, whether you cho whether you're in the in person or online section, include them both, and that is another way to do uh, to stratify through modeling, and we'll see how they compare. And we'll so we'll be building models to analyze our own data, so you can really get a feel for um, what regression is all about. It'll be fun. Okay, so I just first want to make sure you know the basic idea of what we're trying to do. So if the subgroups are balanced like this, we know it's not the lighters, it's, right? But if they're not, we have to keep going. And there's not just one confounder. There could be lots of confounders. And it doesn't have to totally eliminate it. It can be a partial, you know. I'm just giving you a very clear-cut case here. Question so far? OK, so let's go to our own data, because I love real data here, especially ones that are is our own. So. Here's another example of clear-cut confounding in our observa observational data. But this is from our survey data. All right, so this is a question that we haven't analyzed. Did I yet? Yes, this was on survey one, two, right? How many pairs of shoes you have, right? Did you already answer this question? OK, so this is from a past semester. And it says, shoe size and number of pairs of shoes owned. Our survey data shows a negative correlation this isn't this semester's survey data. This, that r is equal to the correlation coefficient is negative. It's pretty high for social science data. Between shoe size and shoe number, what are we talking about? So this is the shoe. I asked you, what size shoe do you wear? I should have had you me measure the shoe, but it's OK. Shoe size, and what's this? How many pairs of shoes do you own is here? So this is the number of pairs of shoes you own. And we see this negative correlation. So what does this mean? Our survey data shows what? That the bigger the shoe size, the fewer pairs of shoes owned. So this is interesting data here. Does that mean that having a bigger shoe size causes people to have fewer shoes? Is there something? If so, how? Or could there be some other difference between those who have bigger feet, besides the shoe size, right, besides the treatment, that could be the underlying reason? So in other words, the big feet are just a marker for the real cause of why they have owned more shoes or less shoes. So the treatment, we could think of it as bigger, small feet, foot size. And this, why don't we just say big feet here, this big feet is leading to less shoes. And you might say, hmm, why? If this were true, why would people have bigger feet buy less shoes? And you might think, oh, maybe they're less available. Or maybe they cost more. If they sell shoes by um, how much leather goes into them, <laughs> the bigger the shoe, the more it costs. So I mean, there could be all sorts of reasons. And that would be a causal link, actually. We could say they're less available. That would be a causal link. Or there could be, sorry, or there could be a confounder, something else, like a lurking variable, a mystery, a third variable that's both leading to bigger feet, it both causes bigger feet, and causes people to buy less shoes. So what you're looking for here is a difference between people who have big feet and small feet. That's the treatment and the control. You can pretend it's that. A difference between them that also um, would cause them to buy more or less shoes. And what is that? What could be a difference between the two groups? Anybody want to say what could be going here? Say what? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear what you said. What did you say? Closet space. Closet space. OK, so people with big feet, oh, because the feet and the shoes are so big, they can't fit in the closet. Now, um, <laughs> like you're a clown. If you were a clown, you'd have to have a pretty big, you can't fit them in. You can only get a few shoes. Uh, <laughs> so that would be here. Wouldn't that be a causal link? My feet are so big, I can't fit them in the closet, so I'm going to buy less shoes. So the closet space, I love it. For those clowns in STAT 100, you might have our STAT 200 closet space. Could be a causal link. Yeah, in the back. Gender. Say again? Gender. Gender. 
So gender how? So you're saying gender. So you're saying males, there's more males with big feet. There's more females with small feet. Now, are you implying that women buy more shoes? <laughs> what a sexist remark. I'm just joking. <laughs> you should see my closet. Oh my gosh, my husband thinks I'm insane. I have like more than, I won't tell you. <laughs> Lots of shoes. I mean, they're in the attic, they're everywhere. OK, yeah. So let's just see if it works. So males, being a male does cause you to have bigger feet. Which comes first? First you're male, then you get big feet. Um, <laughs> when you're like that little sperm in there, I don't think there's much of that, that random sperm. It's that random egg, you know. Okay, so this came first, causes the bigger feet. And I think, I think it also, in this culture at least, causes men to buy less shoes. That's culture dependent, but it certainly, this happens first, and then you see the less shoes. So, yeah, so what do we do? Let's check out this data. Let us check out this data. First, what we could do, let's turn the page. Maybe we should do this, and then we can look at this data and see, how, see what happens when we stratify. But first, let's just look at it here. All right, so now, how can we determine if it's the size of one's feet or gender? or maybe some combination of both, that's the underlying cause of the number of shoes. Remember, what did we say? We said gender was the confounder. So what do you want to do? You want to get rid of that confounder. It's mixing things up. Because the people with the little feet, this is the little feet, the small feet, and they're also female. I mean, they're female, and the people with the big feet are more likely to be male. And then we also have this number of shoes here. That's our response. That's our treatment. And, um, you know, the difference between there. And they're also, it's getting confounded. The confounder is gender, female and male. So we want to get rid of this confounder. So how do we get rid of it? We want to get rid of that confounder. So here's what it says. Stratify the population into subgroups where the confounding factor is the same. It's confusing. It's mixing us up. It's imbalance, making our scales all imbalanced. Get rid of it. That's the idea. You want to eliminate these confounders. So what do you do? You compare. You take two. You look just at the males alone and just at the females alone. And so these are just the males. They don't have many shoes. I'm exaggerating. They're way down here. But I want to see, and just the females. Now we have stratified, we've done, we've stratified into two different groups along the confounding factor of gender. And now, if the difference disappears, what difference do I mean? The difference between, you know, men who have small feet. It's still the same treatment and control, however you want to, it's sort of arbitrary. There's two different, it's arbitrary which one you call treatment and which one you call control. Just these are two, we're comparing these two. So now we have small feet and big feet. And here we have small feet and big feet. And see, if it looks like this, and that's what happens, that means it has nothing to do with the size of your foot <coughs> that's causing this difference. It has nothing to do with that. And I'll show you. Let's look at it. It has to do with what? It has to do with whether you're male or female. All right, so let's just look at this, and um, we'll see the same picture. Let's just look at this picture, and we can see the data, and we can split, in, uh, split the data and see what happens. So let's go over to the uh, PC and uh, get rid of this, and we want to do what? We want to go to a different data set. So we're going to choose STAT100 from a while ago. This was, I think, this data set is from survey. I have it. Which one was this? <coughs> survey 1, Spring 13. OK. So this is STAT100, Survey 1, Spring 13 combined section. OK, so this is the same data set that you have that we have in front of you. And let's look at the scatter plot. I want to pull up the same picture. OK, so here we ask people their shoe size and how many pairs of shoes they owned. Shoe number. 
And you, this should look just like what you see. And you can get this regression line right there. And there's a correlation of negative 0 0.3, a little more than that. And here's the data set. That's what you see. OK, so it shows this negative correlation. All right, now what we said, if we stratify, we want to split along that confounding factor. So let's do that. So we're going to split the plot. We're going to choose a split, male and female, and then split the plots. So look, see how it's balanced now? The correlation coefficient, it's not a negative slope anymore. If anything, it's, well, it's slightly positive. It's not significant. It's the correlation is basically zero, OK? Tiny, tiny bit of positive slope, which is the exact opposite of what it was overall confounding, right? So that's the idea. And what's happening here? Let's put them back together. Let's combine the plots, because I really want you to get a feel for what this looks like. You combine them back. And do you see what's happening? I colored the females. This is STAT100 data, lots more females. I colored the females as purple. Do you see what's driving this? This is confounding, because these, the females are really different in terms of their shoe size than the males. They're smaller on the average, right? And also, they tend to buy more shoes. And it's not just these little outliers up there. You can get rid of those, and you can see it's not going to change things much. Can we delete them? I think I have to go back to the unsplit plot. I'm just curious if it, that's what's driving it. If we delete these points, check out this correlation. It doesn't change that much. It's not these outliers. See, look, it's not really these outliers. In fact, we can get rid of all those. And the correlation even went up. OK, we could even get rid of this little person. It's not these outliers. It's not even those outliers. OK? Because everybody says, oh, it's some outliers. Well, try it. See what an outlier is. Just go in there and play with data. This data program is great. And then you can do the same thing in R. Like, and try to get the same if you're taking the R course. And you can just, it's fun. OK. So that's the idea, and um, do I need to show you anything else here? No, I think we're good here, and let's move on. So any questions so far? All right. So let's just make sure you understand all this. Um, so there's two ways to control for confounders here. There's stratification. That's what we're doing here, and that's what I did on the data program. I just showed you stratification, and we're going to be doing a lot of that, right? That's really good. But there's also, remember, if you stratify in too many things, you need a giant data set. And it gets really, each time you stratify, you get smaller data sets. So another alternative is modeling, including the confounder as an independent variable, a predictor variable, and a regression model. So in part four, that's what we're going to look at this very example. We're going to do the same exact example both by stratification, like you just saw, and by modeling, by including um, doing a regression model where we include two variables, gender as well as the shoe, shoe size, as predictors for the shoe number, for the number of pairs of shoes. And we'll compare them. OK? So the summary of this is what? Observational studies are likely to have confounders. Hidden differences between treatment and control groups that cause differences in their response. And stratification helps remove confounding by comparing subgroups where the confounding variable is the same. Now, you always want to ask yourself, can you turn it around, an observational study, into a randomized experiment? But I don't think you can in this case, because you can't randomly assign. It's like there are, you're already randomly assigned to male and female. You can't. I don't see how you could change that to a randomized experiment. OK. So. Um, you know, this is, I, I was a philosophy major in college. And um, yeah, I know, <laughs> you're surprised probably, right? Well, why'd you pick that? I ask myself that all the time. But anyways, um, uh, I was just, at the time it was before statistics existed. It existed, but nobody, nobody, we didn't have computers, hardly any computers and everything. So I wanted to be a logic doctor, basically. And that's why I was majored in logic. And, in um, college. And so I write, so the, why I'm saying this is because uh, I think that statistics is basically the, the new philosophy. 
your, I mean, that's what it is. I think it's like going around and helping people with their logic. And at least a lot of statistics should be that. So um, why I'm saying this is because the next three, chapters six and seven are basically philosophy chapters, what I mean by causation. Okay? And I just don't want to spend too much time on this, because I know that it's probably not the right forum to discuss this. It would probably do better in a little section. I just want to, to, to and I hope everybody reads this, but I, I, um, I just want to alert you to a few things, OK? And that's all. So when we look at data, we do one or both of two very different things, OK? And one of them is prediction, and the other is finding causes, OK? So, I mean, and they're both, they're just different, all right? So prediction, we want to know what to expect so we can respond best, you know? In medicine, for example, a patient might want to know whether her symptoms and test results indicate that she has a disease and what the prognosis is, even if nothing can be done about it, right? Um, but lots of times we do want to find causes. We want to know not just what to expect, but why do we want to find a cause? We want to know what causes are because we want to be able to change the outcome. And that's different. Sometimes it's even, OK, so in medicine, we want to know what effects some treatment will have. So you might prescribe radiation as a treatment for cancer because you have evidence that radiation therapy causes more cures than deaths. You do this even though radiation therapy is statistically associated with cancer deaths because healthy people aren't treated. So even though it looks like there's an association between getting, getting radiation and getting deaths and death, you're still using this because you know that it's going to uh, cause uh, the cancer to go away. Um, you may choose an action that will save you some money, even though it's negatively correlated with wealth. Buying a car is negatively correlated. Um, you may decide not to buy a car because that will save you money, even though car ownership is positively correlated with death, right? I mean, role, having a Rolls Royce is associated with being rich, but that doesn't mean I should go out and buy a Rolls Royce and you'll get rich, right? OK. So you know the difference, right? And there's really different. Um, it's important. Now, the, it, why I'm talking about this so much is because all the statistical tests, the p-values and everything, and the, um, all the correlation that we see don't distinguish between the prediction and the causation. So that's going to be a big job that we have in STAT 1. In, it's a big uh, focus of this course and was in STAT 100 as well. All right, so um, let's see. Um, what do we want to say? I think for now, you should read this on your own. Uh, because I think we have to, I think there's only so much people can absorb. And I know that, is that OK? So I'm just going to say, read this on your own. And maybe we can discuss it after reading it. But read chapter 6 and read 6 and 7 on your own. And I'd love to discuss it in class when we have time. But I want to get. I think you're going to just fade if I spend too much time on this. OK, I think, why don't we skip to the end, to page 27, to the, um, to the summary here, and just to the conclusions. And um, basically, some things, what we talk about causation, we're talking about causes always have to happen before effects, not after, right? You can't say something's a cause when it happens after. So, um, and you also, um, the best way to assure that, um, the best way to be able to get at confounders is a randomized controlled trial. And um, basically, but a lot of this course is we're not going to have randomized controlled trials. And so we're going to have to tease out causation and observational data. All right. Now, let's move on. The last thing I want to, OK, uh, to end this part, this part before we move on to the next, to end, uh, why is this say part two, part two, and all of a sudden it says part five here. 
What happened? This is not part five. I'm so sorry. This is not part five. This is still part two. All of this, they screwed up the publisher. Anyway, all right. So, because look, here's part three. Sorry about that. All right, so just two things. I, um, I just want you to, let's look at page 28 here. So basically, we're talking about um, making inferences, right? How randomization, how we randomize in statistics to, to, to make um, inferences. Um, and the two things that we want to know that is basically, uh, we're looking at causation. But there's another thing that we haven't talked about yet, and that's extrapolation. So um, there's basically two questions. If you see a relationship between A and B, does one cause the other? Meaning, does changing one change the other? This is what we've been focusing on. And this right here, this causation, is uh, you get at that by how you assign to treatment and control. This is how you get at causation by random assignment. But there's another question, and that's extrapolation. So if you see a relation between A and B, would the relation hold up if you looked at a broader population? We really haven't discussed that. That is how the subjects are chosen for the experiment. If they're randomly sampled from another, from a larger population. So this extrapolation, whoops, extrapolation. is how you sample them from a larger population. Sampling, do you sample randomly or do you sample non-randomly? And um, so let's look at this. So there's two ways that we talk about randomization. So the only time that we can write, we, if you randomly assign, the best way is this right here. You want causation and you want to be able to extrapolate to a wider population. And we really haven't talked about that. So for example, if, we, if our treatment and control groups were, um, if we asked randomly sampled from all the people who wanted to, uh, like if you're giving a drug to uh, help people lose weight, if there's lots and lots of people who want to lose weight in this country, so you would put out a call for, you know, hey, you've got this study, and you'd then randomly sample from all those people who want to lose weight, and then you'd randomly divide them up into two groups and give them the drug, give one group the drug and one group the placebo. So then you could conclude, if you see an effect, the randomization to treatment and control would allow you to conclude causation within that group, but to extrapolate to a much wider group and put error bars around that, you have to have randomly sample from a larger population. So I just thought I would bring that up. I know you've seen a lot of sampling here. So this this is just like a chart here. And then basically the worst situation, whoops, is when you have neither extrapolation or causation. And that's you can't conclude anything. You didn't randomly assign, you have an experiment, you didn't random assign them and you didn't take them from a larger population so you really don't have much. Okay, so ta -da, let's see. Chapter 8. Any questions so far? We're going to get on regression and linear regression. Those of you who've already, this is going to be really easy for most of you because you've already probably seen simple regression. Mm -hmm. Do you have to identify all possible confounders before you even start collecting data on an observational study? Okay, so do you have to, good question. She, he said, do I have to, I, like, like you have to state your null and alternative hypothesis before you look at the data. So he's asking, do you have to say what you think are going to be the confounders before you look at the data? Otherwise, you could look at the data and just cherry pick your thinking, whatever you, uh, whatever the confounders you, you want. Usually, um, you really should look, think about it ahead of time and predict what you think are going to be the confounders. That's an excellent question. And um, like, for example, right now in the, uh, in the experiment that's going on with you guys, I have a few hypotheses. And one of them is that native, non-native speakers 
will do better online because they can watch it over and over and over again. That self-supporting students will do better online because they have a schedule where they have to, they can't come to class, they have to work. And then I think that people who maybe are more socially, more get more energy by interaction with others or more social people, more party type, somehow some measure of social will actually might do better in person because they'll have the energy of, I mean I have these different theories. And you, that's a very good question, excellent question. Basically if you really want to solve problems in the real world, you have to know something about the situation ahead of time. And after years of teaching and thinking about this all the time, I, I'm, I'm hoping I can get at this. So yes, I do. Then you look at the data, and you also get m more ideas for the next time, for, the ne for future data, and so forth. And you can look at it, and if you see dramatic changes, excellent question. Any other questions? I should, I should show you where our data is so far, our preliminary, preliminary data from last semester, but that's another story. Okay. Okay. So here we go. Let's look at this. Now, you've all seen scatter plots, right? And you've all seen these crazy scatter plots, probably, where they have crazy associations. Um, so let's look at this one. We're just this chapter is just about simple linear regression. That means one x variable predicting one y. So you just have an x, y, very nice uh, graph you can draw, a very simple graph. You don't have to go into 3D or anything. So um, the independent variable is usually the x, the one on the x is usually thought to predict the one on the y. Um, now, scatter plots only show whether or not there may be an association between two variables. They don't tell you whether or not that's causal relationship. So I sort of thought of like these four types of associations that, I, that people look at. And one of them that's very common now on websites is this completely accidental, coincidental association that's a result of these big data searches and cherry picking um, variables that form a similar pattern. They never, you never saw this before, but there's, they're very popular now. You'll see them on lots of different sites. And this is one I got from a funny site by a guy named Tyler Viggins called spurious correlations. You should look it up, it's funny. But anyway, I got it from here. And look what this is. This is the number of people who died by becoming entangled in their bed sheets and total revenue generated by skiing facilities. And they happen to have the same. <laughs> no, which one is which? I can't even remember. It's like, I mean, they look almost identical, right? These curves, even the little perturb perturbations here are the same. So he has, does this giant computer search and finds them. And so they're hilarious, and the guy is really funny. You can, he has a lot of them on his site. But this is really not the kind of correlations that, that people get confused about. In fact, we never even knew about these, because you're not going to ever see them unless you do a computer search and cherry pick for them. All right, so those aren't really, that's at one extreme. So we're not really concerned with those. Those aren't things that people mislead people because they don't even know about them unless without you go into trouble to find them. But then there's things that are like these other examples that people that are clear confounding where, um, and everybody knows they're bogus. So like the lighters and the, they're good examples to teach from like the letters in the lung cancer. You knew it wasn't the letters causing the lung cancer, right? Another very common teaching example, the way I learned statistics, I, when I first learned statistics was between drowning, the number of deaths by drowning and ice cream sales. I knew it wasn't ice cream causing drowning, but they're good illustrations, iconic examples. So for example, I don't know if you haven't seen this one yet, it looks like, um, all right, so you, people will show you data, and they'll look at here is ice cream, or the amount of ice cream people eat, or ice cream sales, however you see it. And then on this axis will be the number of deaths caused by drowning. And you'll see some kind of like positive correlation here. And people say, well, is the ice cream somehow making people drown. <laughs> no, but there is a confounder, and that's that ice cream sales happen, go up in hot weather. 
So hot weather leads to more ice cream sales, higher ice cream. People buy more ice cream or more ice cream is sold. And people drown more because they go swimming in the hot weather. And that's the confounder. These aren't really troubling because everybody knows. They're, they're just a way to learn it and to remember it. But then there's so many things that we want to figure out where it's really hard to know what's causing what. Um, for example, health and wealth. Those are really tied together. But is it, how is it causal? I mean, you might think that health, better health, causes more wealth, right? Don't you think so? I mean, if you're healthier, you can work more and stuff. But you also think, hey, if you're wealthier, you can pay for, you certainly can be in better health. You can um, go to doctors, and you can just you know, relax and so forth. Or you know, maybe all three, maybe something like um, learning statistics could cause both of them. Stat 200 can cause you to be wealthier and healthier. It can save your life. OK, so, or, or, some, or a mixture of all three. Anyway, so this is the type of thing, mixture of all three. So this is the type that's really complicated. And all these economic models are super complicated. And everything, I mean, things can be um, causing, there can be, of course, there could be many confounders. And it can also be a causal link, but you don't want to control for the causal link, right? So this is, um, this is where all the action is. Then there's the third, fourth type, which is an example which is clear causation that we already know because we saw experiments were done in the lab. Tremendous amount of data um, has been done on this. We now know that smoking causes lung cancer, but you won't believe this. When I first started teaching STAT 100 back in 83, the book I was teaching out of, that I love the book, said this believed this was still observational data and taught it that way, that this could be confounded. I wouldn't teach it that way because I just didn't want, to, I didn't want people to start. I just thought there was enough evidence by that point. But some diehard statisticians, very famous ones, still didn't accept it back in 83. So why? Because it was observational data, most of it. But they did have data on mice. They had data. I mean, they couldn't randomly give cigarettes to people, to half the people. So they never did the randomized experiment. But they did a whole bunch of stuff in the lab. They did stuff on animals. They did tremendous amounts of natural experiments happened. And so now this is clear causation. And I don't think any of the statisticians continue to deny this or to be skeptical about it. All right? So that's the idea. Now, in the remaining time, I'm going to give you this quick lesson on linear regression. Now, some of, most of, all of you, I think, have seen this before. And if you are in STAT 100, this is just taken straight from STAT 100. So this will be very familiar to you. But if you didn't take STAT 100 here, you probably never in your life saw something called a standard deviation line. So listen up, all right? Because this is an intuitive, very helpful way to teach this. And I think it will help everyone. So, so when the scatter plot shows a roughly linear trend, then a straight line, known as the regression line, right here, this straight line. Now imagine, what is this? This is just like the outline. This is an elliptical cloud of points, right? There's points all in here. This is your x variable, trying to predict your y variable. OK? And this is the regression line. Then there's something else that I bet you never saw if you weren't in STAT 100, and this is called the standard deviation line. Okay, so this is the standard deviation line, and this is the regression line, or the least squares line, you might have known. All right. Now, and this right here, where they cross, is the point of averages. So let's read this. Okay, so when the scatter plot shows a roughly linear trend, like not a curvy linear, but a sort of roughly linear, then a straight line can be fitted through the data to describe that trend by estimating the mean value of y at each value of x. It's called the regression line. It's also called the least squares line because it's the line that minimizes the sum of the squared residuals, the vertical distances. You know, you're making a prediction. You have these errors above and below, and it's the line that minimizes it. Now, a scatter plot can be 
summarized by five statistics, the average of the x, the average of the y, the spread of the x and the spread of the y, that tells you the, what box it's in, but r, the correlation coefficient, tells you the pattern, the linear pattern inside it. And so here's an idealized scatter plot. And here is the slope of the regression line can be figured as r times sdy divided by sdx. Let's highlight this, because you will not be given this. You need to know this. All right. Now, let's think about this, all right? So what this is telling you, a nice way to think about it, is, and we'll look at our regular data to help you with this. Okay, so think about this. Here's, you're trying, here's the average y, it goes like right, is a horizontal line. If there was no correlation, you'd have this like, just line right through the average. Okay, so that's the average of y, right there. All right, now, if there was zero correlation, your best prediction would just be the average for y, no matter what. Like, there's zero correlation between your height and your exam scores, right? So you tell me your height, I might as well just guess the average exam score. I'll do, you know, there's no correlation, it's just a flat line like that, right? But now, of course, your homework scores and your exam scores are probably correlated, so then it's going to look more like this. Now, if they were perfectly correlated, perfectly, then this, every single person would be on this SD line. And what does that even mean? It means you'd be equal standard deviations away from the average in both variables. Think about it. Often your x and your y aren't even in the same units. Let's say this is height predicting weight. So what does it mean if there was a perfect correlation? Perfect correlation means I could perfectly predict one from the other. So if you told me your height, I wouldn't even have to look at you and I could tell the weight. So, but they're in different units. What it means to be, have a perfect correlation is to me, at least in, to have a perfect correlation means you have the exact same z-scores. Exact same z-scores. So if there was a perfect correlation between height and weight, then everyone who is one standard deviation above average in um, height would be one standard deviation of, above average in weight. Everybody who was three standard deviations below average in height, really short, would be exactly three standard deviations below average in weight. The, the rankings would all line up exactly, and that's called the SD line. It's the line, it's the line when you have a perfect correlation. So it's the line when R equals one, or a perfect negative correlation. It would just go down like that. So when R equals one, or negative one, and then all the points lie on the SD line. Then zx is equal to zy. That's what it means to have a perfect correlation. That once we put you into z-scores, you have the same exact z-score. All right, so what's this regression line? When you, this regression line would be the same as the SD line if, if there really was a perfect correlation, but there isn't a perfect correlation in most data, in real world data, unless there's a formula, there isn't. So between height and weight, there isn't. So let's say this was height and weight. So then, what are we doing here? Um, well then, think of it this way. The slope of this line is what? Where does, where does R fit into this regression line? So think, think about like, if you went over if you went over like one standard deviation or two standard deviations or three standard deviations in one direction, to get on the SD line, it would be three standard deviations in the Y direction. So if you went over one standard deviation in the X, this would be, that would be Z equals one, one. Went over two standard deviations in the X, you go up two, that would be two, two, three, three, et cetera. That's the SD line. And you know what this regression line is? It's, watch, if you went over one or two, however many standard deviations in the x direction, you don't, let's look at the three one, you wouldn't go up the whole three. Like if you went over three in the x direction, you wouldn't go up the whole three. This tells you how far you go up. This looks like, if you go, think about this as zero correlation. And this would be a perfect one correlation. And divide this up into, let's say, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, okay? Where this crosses, like right here, let's say that was about 0.5, 0.5, 0.6, 0.7, 0.8, 0.9, 0.10, 0.11, 0.12, 0.13, 0.14, 0.15, 0.16, 0.17, 0.18, 0.19, 0.
That's R. So if you go, and that's where this formula comes from. However many standard deviations you go over in the x direction, you don't go up that many, you go up R amount. Okay, so this is, R is about 0 0.5 here. Now imagine if we had a regression line that was way down here. Let's say it was right, then R would be about 0 0.2. Or if it was way steep, it was almost the same, then R would be 0 0.9. So that's a good way to think about what it's, um, and if, um, does this make sense? All right. So now, um, the typical error around the regression line is given by this formula. Okay, now this one I'm going to put on the first exam. If you want to see what is on the first exam, the formulas you get, you just go here to your practice exam, and you'll see I'm giving you that one, okay, right there. So these two formulas. So now you don't have to memorize this, although I think it's a good thing to memorize, and probably if you're in STAT 100, you've already have memorized it. But the typical error around the regression line is related to the standard deviation of y and to the correlation coefficient. It's known as the root mean square error. And if you square it, it's known as the mean square error. It's going to be the mean square error in R squared, or key statistics in something called ANOVA. Analysis of variance, which we're going to be doing a huge amount of in this class. So R squared is the proportion of the variation of the y's explained by the regression model. And 1 minus R squared is the portion that's left in the scatter. Don't worry if you don't understand this yet. We're going to be talking about this a lot. But this, let me explain this piece of it right here. And then I th let me just explain this. All right? And explain just looking at that formula. I'm not going to prove it for you here. I just want to give you an intuition, all right? Just an intuition. Oh, so you'll see how it works at the extreme cases. So let's think when r is equal to plus or minus 1. What happens? Put a 1 in here, right? Plus or minus 1, and you'll get 1 minus 1, right? 0. So when there's a perfect correlation, this is telling us that the standard deviation of the errors, and remember what that is, that's the typical distance off this regression line. Well, it's like the typical distance these points are off. If there's a lot of error, it's the spread of the errors. The more error there is, you know, it, the higher your standard deviation of the error. If everything's perfectly on the line, you have no error. And that's what, let's draw the picture. If there's a perfect positive correlation, let's just go in this one. That means every single point, it slopes up. A perfect negative one would be every single one Every, there's a perfect prediction. Every point is on a line. It can be perfectly predicted. And the standard deviation would be zero. And that's what this formula gives you. Correct? So that checks out. That's r equals 1. And this is r equals negative 1. All right, I'm just looking at the extreme cases just to give you some intuition. Now, what about, what's the other extreme? How about when there's no correlation, when r equals 0? What does, let's just concentrate here in this first quadrant here, where we think, let's just, r equals 0 means what? Means, it doesn't matter, this is your x and this is your y. There's no correlation, right? No matter if you're low, like this is height and GPA. So my best prediction would just be what? The average y. Why would I predict anything else? Because, you know, this, so this is the average y right here. I just do a flat line. Now think about it. When r equals 0, we put 0 inside here, and we get what? It leads to that the standard deviation of the errors is equal to what? Put a 0 in there, and what do you get? For r, you get 1 times sdy. So that's equal to sdy. Isn't that true? Is that true? Okay. 
Does that make sense? Is the spread around the regression line right here equal to the standard deviation of y? Yes, it is. That's what the definition is. It's the standard deviation is the deviations around the average. And when r is equal to 0, our regression line is just y equals the average of x. No matter what, I mean, oh, excuse me. It's that, um, it's that no matter what x is, y, your, uh, the, the regression line is just the average of y. y equals the average. y equals the average, no matter what x is. And that makes sense, too. The spread around it would just be the standard deviation of the y. So I think that's it.